A Bare Bones Basics of Religion or Why Some Religions Are Not Religions. I want you to note very carefully that if you are not prepared to understand a small prophecy that is woven through all end times prophecy, then I encourage you not to watch this video. I begin this with a strongly held personal statement about the basic stripped down view of religion. Best described as a single or a group of believers held together in a collection of habits aimed at a defined civil moral adherence. A religion promotes that an individual must adjust their life to fit into a group of like-minded individuals, or uh, basically a civilization, if you will, having adopted the same civil moral code and ethics. Thereby, the first reality check, or test, concerning anything that is to be called a religion, it must have a call out for habits, that displays adhesion to a listed group of civil morals. And I'm going to add in here at this point also a faith or faith in a superior being has to be noted and woven throughout the simplest form of religion. Next, let's take a look at what is similar to, but apart from. My view of political ideology can be summed up pretty much as uh, a political governing body or person, individual. And as a word generally, I use this meaning any element that may not require moral adhesion nor any subject or personal faith in a superior being. For even without a superior being, many people are still drawn in to a political ideology like moths to a flame. Now, ideology, I use, uh, you know, basically it's a belief in a wide-ranging collection of ideas, ideals, or actions, or ceremony, that may not even require any leadership, nor require adhesion to well-defined civil morals. An ideology is man-made and is often collected together, coming from wide groups or multiple demographics in society or outside society. Either one doesn't make any difference. Now, civil morals have been mentioned twice so far, and I see this as a prime defining factor between what is a religion or simply a political ideology. So we need to ask, how do we define civil morality or civil morals in this paper? Well, we can break it down simply like this. When morals are applied, an individual can live well in a group or within accepted guidelines of a culture or civilization without being abrasive. The morals of any religion or civilization hopefully become internalized as a code of conduct adhered to by every individual in that society or group. Whereas without civil morals, there is only chaos and a man mentality of everyone for themselves. Now, with those things in place and in mind, let's take another look at religion. Now, I do not study ancient religions or civilizations to great depth, but I can easily work from the famous Ten Commandments as a basis for religion, even though there are eleven, to demonstrate a religion at birth. 
The first three of the Ten Commandments deal with God the Creator and the inner person. They describe how the individual should view their heavenly Creator and how not to mix it up with other items, people, things, and idols. Now I have noticed that as I strive for a good relationship with God, even though failing miserably, my desires for the people, things, and idols are just, well, they just kind of disappear from my I want it list. Desiring that relationship with God becomes an internal guide for me, and the rest grows from that. Thereby, it becomes a habit to seek this relationship with God. But I digress and must return to the issues at hand. The rest of the ten are seven civil moral commandments. They deal with how people should deal with one another, and the blessings are apparent to the believer. Thereby, all ten commandments together are within the simplest guideline definition of a religion. Any individual or group that would attempt to adhere to the Ten Commandments could be called a religion. Nothing else would need to be added to be a religion. But I would add the Eleventh Commandment, as given by Jesus the Christ, to love one another. Now, of course, over time, there were like 290 or more laws added to the Ten. Some were explaining the laws in depth, uh, while others took it a little further down the rabbit trail, and some just got overly carried away. But that just proves that it is in the nature of man to add to or change things around, even from the very beginning. But in that statement, again, I digress a little bit. But what about political ideology? As I summed it up before, is a belief in a wide-ranging collection of ideas, or the ideals, or actions that do not require leadership or adhesion to a well-defined civil moral. <sighs> Just go ahead and laugh out loud when you get that one. The, <laughs> the American style of political partyism is a political ideology. Uh, people that shop only in uh, large name brand department stores adhere to a personal political ideology. And people who live by government support alone adhere to a required political ideology. All I'm trying to do here is make the point that a political ideology can be a very big thing or a very small thing and may not require any cohesive leadership or statement of faith or whatever in any way, shape, or form, but it can be adhered to even if only in the individual. That sounds just a little bit crazy. Or is it? Let us just dig a little bit deeper here, for within all this, there is a secret. I ask this simply, if any or a individual or group is only required to express themselves to an uh, uh, entity five times a day, dream and plan to go to a certain place in the world in their lifetime, and to be at war with anyone that does not believe as they do. Now, even though there may be a code of ethics involved somewhere, maybe with the beekeeper suits or something, but ethics alone do not impose nor call for true civil morality as I understand it to be. So the question is, by that last description, would that be a religion? or political ideology. That choice I leave up to you to decide, but I will express what I believe in just a little bit. So, I'm going to change the theme just a little bit to bring it all together, or scatter it apart. 
moving out past the above question and explaining a little prophecy at the same time. You see, a while back as I was making a video concerning the progression of aggression uh, and the lack of discipline that it permeates in this world and why and how we got there and why it's so. While speaking towards the end, I was taken by a sudden revelation on an entirely different subject. The revelation in that moment was so unexpected and powerful that I blurted it out unplanned in the video. Basically, what I said was the Assyrian is coming. Now, I saw no reason to edit it out, for I thought that it came at that time and the way it came, it should be said. I was very surprised when I viewed the video at just how smoothly that part did come out. Not that I think I'm all that smooth to begin with. And if you watch my, my videos, you know I'm not. But the message was not a surprise. I have known many prophetic uh, scriptures that point out to who the enemies of Israel are. And an enemy of Israel is an enemy of Christianity, and thereby an enemy to the entire world. So I said, the Assyrian is coming. Well, where does that Assyrian come from, and who is he? Well, Ashur, the man, was a son of Shem, a son of Noah. Now, Ashur is at the starting point ancestor of the tribe of the Assyrian Empire. Nineveh, Nineveh. Some of us remember the story of Nineveh from Jonah. And Jonah said something about, hey, I know these people. And, and, and they are not good people, you know. Uh, but nonetheless, the Assyrians were still in God's hand. And we see that in Jonah. And we see that in other places of the Bible. We see that in, in Isaiah. We see that in Ezekiel. <sighs> Let me get back to this. They were in God's hands, and through their mingling with the descendants of Ishmael and many others, they became known by many names, like the Midianites and the Palestinians and, and other names as well. Over time, the Assyrians grew to be a great nation of peoples, even though they lived scattered as self-autonomous tribes or Bedouins throughout the Crescent Lands to the north of Egypt and surrounding Israel. Now's where this gets interesting. Because we have all heard about how Israel had been captured and carried off to Babylon in the ancient days, right? Well, it was Nebuzer Adin, Adin that commanded the Assyrian army which besieged Jerusalem and carried the inhabitants to Babylon. Now, so we got this one, one Assyrian uh, king or captain or whatever that makes war with the Jews and takes them captive. Yet on the other side, we find this Assyrian prince, a snapper, who colonizes the, the cities of Samaria after the Israelites were taken captive to Assyria. And thus we find we have a slightly tainted remnant of Jews that made up a life for themselves and survived outside of Jerusalem and outside of captivity. And they survived there from the time of the Babylonian captivity even unto the arrival of Jesus the Christ in the flesh on earth and are still here today. <sighs> the important part to take from this is that the Assyrians now and then are in God's hands. Even though they now associate by another God, a little G God, the God of this world that accomplishes the bidding of the Creator, High and Holy God. 
Boy, that's a hard one to wrap your mind around, isn't it? It is for me. But the more I dig into it, the more I prove it up, and I'm going, whoa. All the nations surrounding modern-day Israel are of the bloodline of the Assyrians and mixes of other bloodlines with them. And the Assyrians all... Okay, let's try it this way. For those of us, and myself included, for clarity. You see, Satan, or Allah, the liar and the deceiver, and you will find that in the Quran, is moving his physical army into position outside their own nations now, and to all outside nations worldwide. This is being done strategically to cause havoc in those nations and to prepare them, make them ready for the war. The end time siege of Jerusalem. You see, Jerusalem and Israel is the home of the Jews, so to speak. Uh, this is the place of David and uh, you know King David and Solomon and all the, all the way down through time. The Temple of Jerusalem is held captive by the Assyrian Muslims, a branch of the Assyrians, within the city. The Muslim Temple of the Dome is claimed to be over the Jewish Temple and above where they believe the Rock of Abraham and the Temple Altar is at. Now, the rock of Abraham is the place where Abraham took his son up and he was going to sacrifice him because he thought that's what God wanted. Okay. Total confusion. Both gods were working against each other at that point in time. I'll just leave it at that. But all the while, the nation of Israel, now, it's a nation. It has become a nation just like all other nations. A den of sin and abominations. Homosexuality and idolatry is rampaging wildly in the old hometown. Sodom and Gomorrah were completely destroyed for much the same thing. And now abomination stands just outside the temple, held in check by the physical Muslim dome and dirt over it. This, too, is within God's plans. And yet, at one wall, the remaining standing wall, the faithful still pray their voice be heard on high. Whew. You see, I personally do not equate the Islamics or the Muslims as true religions. There are some pieces that are missing from them that I look at as a religion or would cause it to be called a religion. I'll leave the rest to you. But they are political in nature. Their entire homeland is ruled by these politicians that call themselves, uh, oh, what are, I can't think of any names off the top of my head. But anyway, it's very political. Politics and annihilation overrun and overrunning are their chosen methods of expansion, even from their very beginning, by the sword of Muhammad. At best, they might fit my description of a political ideology. And now there are many around me that... that do not believe that the Islamists and the Muslims are the same people. Well, I contend that at least those in the Crescent Lands are of the lineage of the Assyrian. Now it's time for a quick lesson about Muhammad here. You see, when he moved up from when he moved up from the Vatican, the Vatican, he was trained under 
uh, Saint uh, Saint Augustine or Saint Augusta, one or the other. I'm not certain at this time. Don't take that. You can take it to the bank. He was trained in the Vatican. When he got there, he looked at many of the ideologies that are held to by the various Assyrian tribes throughout the land in the time. Now, by blending those tribal ideologies into one single presentation in the writings of, in his book, the Quran, so to speak, thus the foundation for the Muslim nation started. Again, a political nation, not a religion. When the sword in the hand of Muhammad and a few followers set out to convert all the tribes of the Crescent Lands to be Muslim, that was what happened then, and then those who refused to convert, well, he went all Jimmy Jones on them, but he used the sword. All this paid off, though. All this paid off. Because Muhammad had formed up a great and large nation around himself. And it stays much the same today as it has been since around 690-710 A.D. But now that is changing day by day as they are now expanding to the world wide theater. Now let's get on with the old timey prophecy here. You see, every time God brought judgment to Israel by battle, siege, and captivity, the Assyrians were somehow involved, either as themselves being, you know, a nation of conquerors, or by being mercenaries backing up the people that are causing problems in Jerusalem, Judea, and other places. Even when Joseph was taken from the well into slavery in Egypt, it was his own brothers conspiring with the Midianites, a tribal mix of Ishmaelites and Assyrians, that did the deed. And when good things happen to the Jews of ancient times, it is the Assyrians that also had something to do with that. The king that decides that, yes, you can go back and build a temple. Here, I'll even give you some stuff. Take some people with you. You're going to need them. <laughs> so every time good happens and every time bad happens, these descendants of Ashur are the ones that God uses to get the job done. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, man. <sighs> Why? For one, they truly are brothers in the flesh. You take it back all the way to the flood, at least, and beyond. They're all brothers in the flesh. But the biggie is because everything is truly in the hands of God, our Creator. He's going to use someone or something to bring judgment to someone or something. And that's the way he works. And with the Israelites, it's always been the Assyrians at the top of that list. The Assyrians have been the rod that pokes and prods the Jews back when their ways have gone errant. Now, historically, every time God tells his prophet, Hey, you guys down there are doing some idols and other bad things that I told you not to do, so I'm going to bring some armies up against you, and they will take you away. Well, every time, in one way or another, it was the descendants of Ashur who carried out the judgment of God. Now in modern times, just as with ancient times, the Assyrians have many names. They are called Islamists, a fundamental Islamist too. Muslims, Palestinians, Iranians, Hamas, Syrians, just to name a few. And some of them reside in Egypt. Now it's important that I put that there because that fits into a prophecy also. Now, just as in ancient times, God is starting the end time clock again. You see it? It goes and it stops, and it goes and it stops. It, it 
this happens, and then we wait. There's a period of time before the next seal is opened, or however you want to put it. I'm not quoting the Bible here. I'm just you know I'm just trying to you know explain how it works. <sighs> now, as never as never before, Assyrians are spreading out among all the nations of earth, and I believe this is to cause civil unrest and political upheaval to the bidding of their master Satan. Now remember this, it is not that these people are evil in and of themselves, but the ideology that they hold to teaches them that this is what they do. Now, all of the world has pretty much been told the greatest story ever told. It's pretty much very close to being finite, done. And as Christians, from the Jews, we are connected there uh, by religious artifacts, so to speak. Through that connection, would we also be a target? Of the Assyrian. I do believe that to be true. I believe that when uh, the 9 11 thing happened, no matter who conspired to do it, to get it done, and everything else, it was those of the Assyrian nations that did the deed. And I believe, and I believe it now, and I believed it then, that that was a harbinger telling. America that he has gone far enough away from God that judgment is going to come. But I believe that all these events will be used to bring about a march of nations to the war, the siege of Jerusalem. And I believe that that all this is at least part of the evil strategy. Now, I'm calling it evil, yeah. But it's still a strategy that is playing out or is getting prepared to play out even today. The God of all heavens and earth is allowing this to happen as it is and always has been within his plan foretold by the prophets. And you'll find them throughout the scriptures. If I am correct in this, your question could or should be, what can we do about this? One thing must be first, first things first, and that is your personal relationship with Jesus the Christ, our Lord and Savior. Even the Jews must come to know Jesus the Christ as their Lord and Savior before their departure. Now I know, today's political correctness. Uh-oh. Boy, I'm in trouble now. I must be a Semite or something or an anti-Semite or some other name they're going to call it. Who knows? Who cares? I'm a heretic, okay? Leave it at that. I am such a terrible person to say that, but even their own books tell them this is true and it will happen. So, the Jews, as well as everyone else who is to be saved, must take on the blood of Jesus the Christ at an individual choice. Now, you can either accept Jesus as Lord and Savior now, freely, or later, through much tribulation and subjection. Because the Assyrian is rising faster and faster, with his sword outstretched from along the nations. And where will your soul find rest? As it has been from the beginning, 
The choice is yours and yours alone. You are either for him or you are against him. The denominations cannot save you. The congregations cannot save you. You cannot save yourself. Only a personal relationship with Jesus the Christ, the high and holy judge of all the living and the dead, can save you. But what will you be saved to? You see, so far, I have walked us through a possible understanding of what a true religion is and an understanding of what is not a religion. I have indicated to you that there are among us right now an army of Satan marching to the world powers toward those final days, bringing these things about. True, all these things right now at this point seems like I'm all gloomy doomy, huh? And you're like saying, uh, when it's over, it's uh, over. Well, that is true, except for those who are in Christ. For there is, after that end, a new Jerusalem, a renewed life. A new existence. I cannot begin to understand all that comes after the end, but the prophets and the apostles have spoken of it. Now God the Father has never steered me astray. His prophets of the Bible and his apostles have never led me astray. I'm the only one that can lead myself astray. So why would I not believe them when they speak of the new Jerusalem and the other new things that we do not and cannot understand from where we are. I, for one, am looking forward to a place without the trials and the tribulations of these times in this flesh. A place where the lion and the lamb can be as friends in a world free of cancer, diabetes, and other sicknesses. Food that isn't trucked across the country, taxed at every stop, stored up in a brick and mortar for the profit of a few. Sounds great to me, as I imagine it, but that's all I can do is try to imagine. Now, of course, my imagination is fueled by the scriptures, but is not totally within the scriptures. But I am certain that whatever Jesus has in store for those who love him is far better than my imagination can possibly dream of. So you see, there is light at the end of that long, dark, tunnel that this world is racing as fast as it can to reach. And I, I long to be in that light, in that kingdom of God. And I hope and pray that you will be there also. Come on now. Open the door. Let Jesus in. Allow the Holy Ghost to cleanse you and to prepare you and to dress you for the great wedding. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. We all recognize John 3.16. And I close now. But I say until next time. This is B.D. Baker saying, <laughs> See you at the wedding. <laughs>